Royal Highnessness, uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, fellow scientists, young Fuscher. So it's really a pleasure for me to be here today. It's, uh, I told someone just uh, before that it's for me the first time uh, in about two years that I'm speaking in front of an audience. So that is um, also somewhat special for me. <laughs> tonight and I would really like to really stress the point that uh, Mara really did an awesome job and uh, you were facing these technical problems that we always face also at the big conferences so don't worry about that it was a great job and uh, I, I guess all this uh, fancy electronic gear and audio systems they are also kind of not used anymore to <laughs> be at the conferences. So we are talking about the uh, water futures today and I will try in the next 30, 35 minutes to give you an insight in, uh, into all the work that we have done uh, over the last 20, 25 years. And um, so this is uh, a very uh, short view of the um, topics that uh, I'm going to address today. So. First of all, setting the scene, what are we talking about when we talk about uh, global change and how the water cycle is impacted. Then also a few elements about what the water cycle actually is, so the components of the water cycle. Then very important, the toolbox that we have for investigating the water cycle. Then um, you will see that we are still facing today a lot of difficulties in, to, in, in really understanding how the water cycle is functioning and that we are sometimes facing technological limitations and that we try to overcome. And uh, then also a few hopefully positive perspectives uh, that I can give today. So setting the scene. Um, so this is one of maybe two or three a bit um, gloomy slides um, for today. So we all know that there's a climate change going on. Uh, actually, climate has always been changing, so we should never forget that. But it is true that um, human activities have really, um, I would say, um, played the role of a catalyst and, and have really um, um, contributed to um, accelerate certain uh, mechanisms. So we are clearly on a hothouse earth pathway. And there's not that much time left to change that and um, to um, not go this way of the trajectory, but rather this way. So um, there's clearly toxic trajectories um, uh, that we will face under future climate conditions if nothing uh, is done to prevent that. We have two examples here. So on the left you see, uh, and we experienced that last year, the heavy precipitation events that are very likely to further increase. So we will be facing other events like the ones we uh, faced last summer. Um, I mean, those are pictures uh, taken, I think this one is from 2018 in the Müllertal, so where we had these uh, severe flash floods. And uh, we have on the other side also the increase in temperatures and um, they will certainly contribute to increase the frequency of droughts and that has severe implications of course for um, food production, um, I mean agriculture in a large sense, and of course also the wine production, just here as an example. So, um, very important, non-stationary is clearly in science today the new paradigm. What does it mean? Well, it means that first of all, in the past, so we have been monitoring like parameters like air temperature, precipitation, uh, um, atmospheric pressure, you name it basically. But the problem is, um, it's only very recently that we have started to measure more and more of these parameters and also in many places all over the world, but it hasn't been like that um, in the past. So we lack understanding of how the environmental systems were behaving, for example, 200 years ago, 1,000 years ago, and that means that all the tools that we have developed, the forecasting systems, we push them more and more to their design limits um, when we ask them to help us anticipating how um, environmental systems are going to behave under a changed climate. So that is really the, the most tricky part uh, that uh, we are facing today in our research. 
So the water cycle, I briefly mentioned um, that I would like to introduce you to the, the main concepts of the water cycle. So you always have to keep in mind that we as hydrologists, we work in spatial entities that look like this. So this is a catchment, a river basin if you want. Um, for example, DLZ is a river basin that is part of the Sur river basin that is then part of the Mosel and so on. And um, what we are looking at, it might sound trivial, but it's precipitation. So we would like to know uh, with a lot of detail how much uh, rain or precip I mean precipitation in a large sense, snow is entering the system. Because then uh, a part of that um, water will be taken up by the vegetation, will be evaporated, will be transpired. Um, another part of the rain will infiltrate into the soil it might uh, percolate uh, further deep into the groundwater bodies. And then at some point, this groundwater will be released and feed the, the creeks, the rivers, the streams. And this happens all over the world, of course. And why is it important? Why does it matter to understand these components and how they interact? Well, because it tells us something about how floods are generated. Um, it tells us something about the water balance in agricultural systems. So is there enough water, maybe too much water? Is there erosion maybe taking place? It is important for uh, the trees, of course, that they have enough water. It is important in terms of agricultural production. Uh, if we have droughts, um, that of course may uh, reduce the crop yield. It may also impact the water quality because if, when you don't have enough water in the streams, it means that the temperature is rising, it means that um, toxic substances, I mean Mara was talking about it, then the concentrations, they may eventually uh, increase and um, that in the worst case might kill, for example, fish in the creek. So the water balance um, with all its components, this is what interests us. And um, so this looks rather simple. Uh, as of today, the water that we have in a, in a catchment uh, is a function of the incoming rainfall, the incoming precipitation, minus the water that is leaving the catchment, minus the water that is transpired by the, by the vegetation, and of course, plus minus the water that is um, already in the system and that might leave the catchment um, in, in a very deep subsurface, because these catchments are not necessarily completely impermeable, of course. So, um, after these um, uh, introducing words about the water cycle, um, here's a very um, quick view of how certain catchments here in Luxembourg uh, actually are behaving. So we have three different types of geology. You have the sandstone in green, you have the malts in uh, red, and then the schists that are typical for the Ardennes in blue. Now, you can see here on these two figures um, very strong differences in behavior of these three types of catchments depending on whether a rainfall event occurs in winter or in summer. Just take a look at the sandstone. Actually, there's not much difference between winter and summer as uh, compared to the miles where you have a very flashy response in winter and almost none in summer. Why is that so? Well, because the sandstone functions like a big sponge. It is just capable of absorbing the water regardless of how much rainfall is coming down and then it gradually releases it uh, throughout the year. For the miles, it's very different, it has a very small storage capacity and that storage capacity is very quickly reached in October, November and then you start to have these very flushy uh, responses. Whereas in summer, well, they run dry, there's no water in those creeks and therefore you, you see hardly any response there. Um, the schists behave somewhat in between the two. It's again totally um, related to the geology, I cannot go here into all the details, but this is mainly meant to show you how the underground, how the geology is really um, uh, controlling the way how our uh, rivers and creeks respond to incoming precipitation. Uh, so now, please, can you just launch the uh, movie? So here you see um, um, 
a movie that we have made with 15 uh, minute images taken in a small creek um, in the Ursling. And it's really like a, a living organism, basically, right? That uh, has a pulse. And we could go on with this and, and have the, the summer, and you would see how it runs dry, basically. So it's um, really the pulse of the catchment. And this pulse is changing due to global change. So, and that means we have an accelerating water cycle. There's definitely something going on that makes these systems overreact. So there's so much precipitation coming down in a very small location with very high density, and, uh, intensity, sorry, and they just cannot digest all that water. And this is then what happens. You have massive uh, surface runoff, a lot of erosion and damage that's taking place. So look at this picture taken in a forest in the La Rochette region. You see the naked bedrock. Everything has been washed away within half an hour. So this is massive. This is something that you would have seen 30 years ago in the Mediterranean region, but not here. So it really is an alarm bell ringing here. So is this going to be the new normal? Probably. So, um, what is the hydrological toolbox that we have at hand so for investigating the environmental system complexity? So, here you see a um, simplified um, figure of what we call the critical zone. So, where you have the atmosphere, you have the vegetation, the living organisms, you have the soils, water, and then the bedrock. And everything that happens in between these compartments, well, this is what we are looking at and what we try to understand how water is actually moving through these different compartments of the um, critical zone. Now, there again, the difficulty is that you have plenty of literally dozens of processes that are taking place at different spatial scales and temporal scales. So you have to, so unfortunately today we cannot go into detail, but you have to know so that um, the water that you see uh, during a flood, like for example last summer, there was a huge flood, um, there's water in there that is a few hours old, but there's also water in there that is days, weeks, years, decades, and even hundreds of years old. So it's a mix, it's a blend of water. And that makes the whole um, system so difficult to understand as to really um, anticipate what compartments are contributing to building a uh, flood hydrograph. Oops, I went a bit too quick. And we are very lucky in Luxembourg that we have this kind of nested setup where we have different types of geology, land use, topography that we span with our network of stream gauges so where, where we measure um, the changes in water levels in the creeks and rivers. And this is something that has been a game changer in the sense that we have really gained an understanding of how geology controls the response of our systems. And that will allow us also to anticipate how um, adapted they are to respond to changing climate conditions. So depending on the geology, certain catchments will be very responsive to a climate change signal and others will maybe exhibit actually no, no change in response. So, um, what are the tools that we have? Well, we have for the meteorological parameters, we would have the classical tool like a meteorological station where we measure precipitation, wind speed, air temperature. Today we can also measure the size of the droplets, how fast they are falling, is it rain, is it snow, is it hail. Um, we have weather radars, so they span very large areas where you then see the spatial distribution of the rainfall. For the surface water, we, we have, as you can see, colleagues of mine that go into the river during the flood, sometimes a bit risky, and they measure how much water is flowing through the river at that spot. And then we have special wires where we can uh, then install an instrument that is measuring with a lot of precision the variations in water levels. We observe our systems also with satellites Today, you have certain satellites that can look through the clouds and they see, they can actually detect soil moisture, they can detect the extension of a flood. Within a few hours, you have all this information over huge areas 
and, as I said, looking through the clouds with microwaves. Then we have tools for looking into the ground, classical, we can make boreholes, but we can also run an electric current through the soil and that gives us information about what the structure of the soil is uh, up to 80 meters down uh, into the uh, ground. We have certain tracers like isotopes, uh, chemical elements, I will say a few more words about that in a minute. So, very nice, we have this uh, wonderful toolbox, but the problem is we have unfortunately limitations um, that we have to face, technological limitations. If I take rainfall, we measure rainfall with these small devices. You certainly have already come across some of these uh, in, in nature. They are very small. They just cover 200 square centimeters. Now, they are very precise, but only in a specific location. So that means when you have a strong rainfall event, well, if you're lucky, your rain gauge is exactly here where the most intense rainfall has been fortunately detected with a weather radar, but you may also be completely off the wall, like we were here. So there were only two stations, not really in the center of the, um, of the heavy rainfall event. And so uh, there's, there's many other difficulties actually related to the way how we typically uh, classically measure rainfall, but um, this is obviously the most important one. Um, then very important to us also is to understand like how saturated areas develop because in those areas you won't have any rainfall infiltrating into the ground. It will all run off the surface and rapidly reach the creek. So the tools that we have is looking at the vegetation. We can also walk around and see if the, 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 the soil is muddy, but this is very coarse, it's very time consuming and um, so there clearly is a limitation in that respect. Then I said that we have certain traces. We have geochemical traces, so looking at certain elements that are dissolved in the water, and they can actually allow us in this specific point to really know from where the water is coming in the catchment. So geographically speaking, we can say so and so many percent are coming um, from 10 kilometers upstream or, or only from two kilometers from the, the outlet of the catchment. Then we have the isotopes, so basically oxygen and hydrogen. So we have instruments where we can determine the, the isotopic signature of the water, and that helps us to determine how old the water is. Is it really precipitation, so the rainfall that has fallen in the few hours before that has reached the, the, this spot here, or is it maybe water that has fallen a few weeks ago? Because uh, actually, this is what happens in nature, and this is why we speak about uh, the old water paradox. So having a flood wave, but it's mostly made of old water. So, um, a difficulty there is that, um, and this is a colleague from ETH Zurich who had a wonderful paper on this, he was saying that actually what we are trying to do with the traces, with the, the, the rain gauges and, and all these nice instruments that we have is like trying to understand the Beethoven symphony uh, if we could only hear one note every minute or two. Because it's, 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 it's really just patchy information that we get. And uh, this is also what happens when we go to the field and we take water samples, we bring them to the lab, we do the analysis, so it's very coarse information. And when we talk about flash floods, you can imagine that if you go once per day, even once per day, to a specific spot, you, you might just miss the flood wave. And so you lose the information. So how can we overcome these um, challenges? Um, well, I come just back one, one second to what I said at the beginning. So we have this limitation that uh, our tools are kind of uh, um, Unappropriate. They, they, they are pushed beyond their design limits, right, for, for uh, anticipating what is going to happen in the future. So what we need is, first of all, new hypotheses, so new ways of thinking how the environmental systems are behaving, have been, have been behaving in the past, how they behave today, and how they might behave in the future. Then we need new technological developments for testing these hypotheses, and from those experiments, 
from those uh, hypothesis tests, we can then infer new concepts of how we perceive the environment to function and we translate them into mathematical equations and into programming language so that we can build digital twins, like we call them, of the critical zone. That will eventually be the tools of the future for better anticipating where we are heading. Are we on the hothouse uh, earth pass or can we still, when we take certain measures, avoid this uh, gloomy scenario? So, therefore, we have in our uh, institute, we have developed a kind of uh, 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 research value chain where we do basic research, so these new outrageous hypotheses, then we try to develop new technological solutions for testing these hypotheses. They help building the digital twins of the critical zone and that leads to more robust uh, predictions of the future. So a few examples of uh, outrageous hypotheses. I um, give this example because it's very telling. So a few years ago, we stated this hypothesis of having bedrock geology being really the major control of uh, the hydrological functions of the catchments, meaning collecting the water, storing the water, mixing the water, and gradually releasing the water. So th those are the fundamental hydrological functions of catchments. And for that, we use the isotopes of the water molecule. So oxygen is not oxygen. You can have oxygen 16, 17, 18. So being a little bit uh, more heavier, so 18 is a little bit heavier than 17, which is a bit heavier than 16. And we do the same, by the way, with hydrogen. And so we measure those concentrations in precipitation, as you can see here. So those variations correspond to seasonal variability in the precipitation signal, uh, in the isotope signal in precipitation. And then you see what the catchment does with, with this seasonal uh, variation. It transforms it so that the amplitude is reduced and there's also a time shift. And these two informations help us to uh, actually infer the age of the water. And um, so on the water release aspect, we have been, and this is the first time this was done worldwide, so we were able to show that depending on the percentage of impermeable bedrock, the mean age, this is the mean age of the water, is actually decreasing. So those would be catchments that have impermeable bedrock, typically mars, so very young water in comparison to catchments where you would have um, a higher percentage of permeable bedrock, so typically sandstone, and uh, there you would have higher water age. Why is that important? Well, if you want to use, like the city of Luxembourg does, they take 50% of their drinking water from the Luxembourg sandstone. That water has been traveling for decades through the sandstone, and it's a wonderful natural filter, so it's good quality water that you get there. Here, in those young waters, you have all kinds of contaminants of um, toxic substances that might be present that have not been filtered out. So this has been published in the meantime. There's uh, many colleagues from our institute, but also uh, from Canada and New Zealand that have contributed to this. So the high reward, uh, high risk, high reward technological developments. So I guess, uh, I mean, a few years ago, I would ask the question, who has mobile phone in the room? Today, you can't do that anymore. I would say 99% of the people do have a mobile phone. Um, what makes it so special? Well, actually, your mobile phone is like a rain gauge because these antennas that are used for transmitting the microwave signal, um, they are influenced by precipitation, by rainfall. So what we did is that we installed Together with Post Luxembourg, we installed uh, two microwave links, experimental microwave links. Then we had um, these violet uh, dots here, they represent the rain gauges. So there we were measuring precipitation, so to have a kind of uh, um, uh, ground truth information. And you see here, when it rains, the microwave signal between the antennas is weakened. And we were able to translate that weakening of the signal into um, precipitation. And that means that instead of having this dotty information, uh, 
we can, with these microwave links, and there's plenty across the landscape, um, you can reconstruct at a very fine time scale and a very high spatial resolution, you can reconstruct uh, incoming precipitation, which is a game changer when it comes to uh, forecasting a flood. So, another example is thermal infrared imagery. Look at this creek. Uh, it's the Weyerbach in the Ösling. So when you look with a thermal infrared camera, you can see this. And this is all red, showing the high temperatures. And this is actually what I mentioned beforehand. It's the old water that is uh, leaving the hill slope because it has been raining in the hours before. So the new water has infiltrated and pushed the old water out of the hill slope. So that is what is happening here. And that, that is feeding actually the river. So a very important information. So maybe you can just very quickly run this graph too. Because here you see in a headwater catchment, so really upstream, uh, how a flood wave is actually generated. You see how the water is gradually pressed out of the hill slope. So with the colors getting uh, brighter and brighter. So first time that this was documented ever was here in Luxembourg with these uh, tools. So, um, we have another um, avenue that we have explored together with the colleagues in the material sciences department. We were really wondering, so it is so cumbersome, so difficult to go to the field, to take the samples, bring them to the lab, do the analysis. There's literally days between the moment where you do the sampling and where you get finally the analytical results. So the idea was to develop with the colleagues an instrument that we could take to the field and do the measurements directly in the field. So this is the um, small-sized mass spectrometer that eventually actually has now been further developed by the colleagues in the material sciences department um, in, the, in, in the framework of uh, space resources related projects um, where they would hopefully one day have one of these instruments uh, measuring uh, stable isotopes of oxygen and hydrogen on the moon. So this is what I was just mentioning, a new field of research that is developing exohydrology, so studying the water cycle on an, another planetary body. And we have started two years ago from those technological developments that I mentioned a project uh, where we will work to get where we actually are working with the European Space Agency and now just kicked off uh, our participation in the science team with NASA um, where we are looking at water pools on the moon. And um, there's different reasons for that. You might use the water on the moon for producing rocket fuel. You might also for future lunar bases, you, you need fresh water. And um, so this is the mission called PROSPECT that we are actively uh, participating in. And uh, we're really looking forward to that with a great deal of anticipation. It's really genuine technology developed in Luxembourg that will be used for making um, the, the um, models that are needed for translating actually the measurements that are done on the moon into uh, useful information in terms of how much water is there, um, where exactly is it, is it located because it's not evenly distributed, etc. Um, another crazy idea, if I might say so, uh, that we have been investigating is to overcome the fact that we have very little time series of isotope signatures in stream water because, as I said, it's very difficult to obtain them. Uh, you have to go to the field, take the samples, bring them back to the lab, etc. So we thought, well, maybe we can use organisms that live in the rivers as archives of isotope signatures. So they live there all the time. And they might take up the isotopic signature of the water in their shells. And so uh, we could overcome this limitation because certain species of freshwater mussels, they can live up to 200 years. 200 years. So we could go back 200 years in time. So that's what we did with the colleagues in the material sciences department. They have these instruments where they can um, throw an iron beam on the growth rings. So this is uh, one year 
um, they can have these ion beams hitting a growth band and uh, you see these dots, then um, the isotopes are, it's like an explosion, they are broken out from the growth ring, they go into an electromagnetic field and they can measure, is it O16, O18, etc. So we have in the meantime been able to publish this methodology and to show that it works regardless which climate you're in, uh, different types of species of mussels. And so now we have a project going on where we will, for the first time, reconstruct these long series uh, in Luxembourg. And the idea has already been picked up and also uh, tested in other uh, environments, like for example in Sweden. So, um, now very quick, um, how can we translate all that newly gained knowledge into the digital twins, so the forecasting systems um, for these extreme events that I mentioned. So look at these images. So they are from uh, Austria, but still this is exactly what was happening also uh, in 2016 and 18 uh, in Luxembourg. So these kind of really very intense local rainfall events where, where very large amounts of water are pouring down and so what they, what they generate, especially, of course, in, in hilly regions like the Alps, we can see that over here, if you just run that movie too. So this is really spectacular. Unfortunately, we don't have that kind of um, camera that has been around for uh, observing that kind of event. But this is typically, even though at a smaller scale, but you can still see the rills in La Rochette, where a kind of similar process took place. So, and there it's quite obvious that it's important to um, better understand the processes that are leading to, to such extreme events. Of course, again, you have to place this in the local context, is in the, in the Alps. The rainfall intensities are even much, much higher than what we have observed here. So, we had uh, uh, recently a project together with uh, the Water Agency and Post Telecom where we have tried to rely on new technology, um, so related to IoT, so the Internet of Things, the idea being to have more stations that could potentially also be mobile, where you could adapt your, your rain gauge network, and uh, so to have more timely information feeding forecasting systems. And so to be able, because in, especially in that kind of context, every minute almost that you gain uh, can be a game changer in terms of saving lives and saving infrastructure. And um, also um, what is very important that the, is that these new technologies um, have also helped now with uh, very powerful computational systems to make um, projections of how the climate might evolve in the coming decades in Luxembourg. And uh, you can clearly see that we are definitely on this um, trend that you can see elsewhere in the world. And if nothing changes in terms of emissions of greenhouse gases, this is where we are going to be. So we are going to gain another degree, degree and a half, in the next um, 40, 50 years. And um, if we look at precipitation, this should not mislead you. Um, here you see the projections for precipitation. It seems like everything is okay. No, it's not. Because what we have indeed um, seen over the past decades, and this seems to be also the trend for the coming decades, is that we might not necessarily have less water, annually speaking, but it's mm, very likely that it will be distributed in a different way. So more intense rainfall events, which has you at the end of the year with the same amount of rainfall that came down, but it has been distributed in a different way. So mm, a greater likelihood for heavy floods and on the other hand also a higher likelihood for droughts. So, um, well, basically this is already uh, what, I, what I just mentioned. And um, so the perspectives. So we, we, we really would like to have our research being um, used as um, a sound scientific 
basis of information for detaching the socio-economic development that we all want and that we all need uh, from the environmental pressure. So that, that is really why we, we are looking into these problems, where we, why we try to find new avenues for overcoming the technological limitations that we are facing. And, um, well, as I also said at the beginning, we have developed a value chain where we really spend this whole chain of developing new sensors, generating new types of data from which we can uh, extract more information, uh, different types of information that will then eventually be, tra be transformed into knowledge and that knowledge will inform the decision makers that will be able to take better actions. So, and of course, all of this, I mean, I'm just a messenger, so all this work is done by uh, nearly 60 people. There have been generations of students before, uh, in, in the, so that were before all these people over the past 25 years, so many PhD candidates, postdocs, engineers, technicians, and without them, without their power of interdisciplinary approaches, um, it would just be impossible to tackle all these aspects. So, thank you very much for your attention, and um, yeah, I'm open for whatever comes next, questions or... <laughs>